Meaning and purpose in life is not something that is given to one. It's earned. It's something that comes through significant service and contribution. This is uh, the question of how to make service and contribution part of the growing up experience of all Americans and hopefully for people in other parts of the world is in essence what I've been following all my life. I guess my story starts in Korea. This is not Fargo, this is... <laughs> 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 this, is this is just off the DMZ where I went in the, in the 60s as a soldier. And while there, I was able to connect with uh, Korean colleagues and, and be a part of a startup of a school program there that brought American GIs into schools as volunteers. But this was something that, that was troubling in, in many respects for me as well, because I soon discovered that the idea of contribution and service and the military experience was not the best thing for me. I've since have become a pacifist and believe that uh, violence and uh, war are not the best ways of solving problems. And so finding a, a non-military route to, to service and universal service is something I began to pursue. Support for the idea comes, and for those of you who want to, want to track this further, through the 1910 essay of, of the, the philosopher William James and psychologist William James on the moral equivalent of war. And, and James's idea was that we could create, hopefully, in, in a larger society, a, a way of bringing people into service and contribution that did not involve violence. That was something that could be uh, take the advantages of all the things that happen that are very positive in a military experience in terms of camaraderie, uh, working together across cultures, challenge and adventure, but do it for peaceful ends. The James idea became reflected in American society through the Civilian Conservation Corps of the, of the 1930s. In fact, in 1931, President Roosevelt put over 500,000 uh, young men who were unemployed into camps throughout the country um, in a matter of six months after he was inaugurated. It, it's considered the most successful of the New Deal programs. And then, of course, we know about the Peace Corps in 1961. Uh, President uh, Kennedy, of course, was very much, uh, is, uh, very much associated with the Peace Corps. And then, uh, more recently, we have AmeriCorps, VISTA, and what we call Learn and Serve, which is also the, the program design that is associated with service learning. For me, the idea of finding a, a route to service and service learning uh, of a non-military sort started in St. Louis after I came back from the military. There I was called in to work with a group of, of uh, educators around creating a, a tutoring and mentoring program for young people of different races and cultures. St. Louis at the time, in the late 70s, was going through a very traumatic uh, desegregation and busing situation. So how could, how could young people come together across cultures in St. Louis that would allow them to know each other in a shared significant life experience? It was in St. Louis that I met Derek Jackson. And Derek Jackson changed my life. Derek was one of the young tutors and mentors, 17 years old, working with his peers from the suburbs to create this summer school model, basic math, basic uh, reading, literacy. They were tutors working with, with experienced teachers. So Derek was part of the training, and there was a very active uh, startup every, every morning in the program where young people would come together. There would be aerobics. There would be announcements and so on. Derek was learning the, the, the way that the, the training was going to be set up. He was in the gymnasium, and I was observing what was going on. Didn't want to get too involved in the aerobics. It was OK. Uh, I, can, I can coach people a lot better at it than me. Uh, anyway, Derek was, was in there, and then he stopped, and he walked out of the gymnasium, walked right past me. Derek, what are you doing? 
you got to learn this stuff. You know, they're, they're, you're going to have to leave this stuff in, in, uh, in a week or so. <sighs> Big sigh. He said, I'm sorry. I, I, I really can't do any more. My leg hurts. Come on, Derek. You can do this. He's about 6'2". Anyway, so I, he said, no, I, my leg really does hurt. He, he bent down and, and pulled up his pant leg to show me the bullet hole and the blood streaming out of his calf. As we were going to the hospital, I asked Derek, why in the world didn't you say something? Why didn't you offer uh, just a pause and say, hey, I, I need some help here? Why in the world did you take a city bus that morning for an hour? And, and already we're in the training for a half an hour. Why? Why? Why didn't you say something? It wasn't that unusual, of course, that a young person in St. Louis was going to be shot. But his not saying something was of concern to me. And he said, I was afraid of losing my position. I think those kids need me. I want to go back in there and help out. And something happened in me as I digested that. And, I, and since, as I think about young people, it's about, it's the essence of what we call service learning. It's a way, it's a new way of thinking about young people. It's not people who are there just to use resources of the schools or the youth organizations. It's, it's, these are people like us who want to contribute. They're, they shouldn't be considered recipients of service, but people who are willing to give and have vision and can provide leadership. They want to be a part of having a stake in the society. So I went from St. Louis to the University of Minnesota, and we started the NYLC in, out of uh, out of the Center for Youth Development Research, where we, we, we started gathering the ideas around positive youth development and the possibility of, of involving young people in service. And you've seen this pyramid before, but one of the things that goes along with positive youth development and the idea that young people are contributors is the notion of active, engaged learning. You take a person like Derek, and he's involved in, in teaching and learning uh, activities for younger people, he has to go through a training of his own. So in terms of the pyramid, you look at the top of the pyramid. What I'm doing right now is the most efficient way of delivering information, shooting it right out at you. That's the top of the pyramid. But the retention rate, as represented by the size of the top, is the lowest. As you move down through levels of engagement, uh, bring in some audiovisual, bring in some activity, some working together. And then you get to the last element of the pyramid. Some of you teachers, maybe you can help me on this. If you really want to learn something, you teach it. If you learn, teach. What was the one-room schoolhouse about? The idea of bringing it out to the next level. And the neuroscientists call it metacognition, thinking about learning. And thinking about what you're taking in is required when you take it to the young person or to another person. Well, young people are assets and resources and can do a tremendous amount. Right here, right here in Fargo, there's, there's a tremendous activity out of the Fargo Dome that, that I, I've heard a lot about in terms of gathering food and, and providing some teaching around nutrition and food. In education, the cross-age tutoring method that Derek was a part of on a small scale is widespread. Around health and disease, there's a lot of preventive things going on involving young people in coaching activities with younger children. In environment and energy, a very good example is what, they're, what they've been doing in Henderson, Minnesota, just down the river from Minneapolis to St. Paul, where young people out on a field trip found, as a part of their uh, collecting of specimens, a number of frogs that had too many forelimbs and back limbs, deformed frogs. And they reported to their teacher, but they didn't really respond. And they said, no, look, look we, we want to go back out there. So they went back out there. And then they released their findings kind of on a low level to the local press. 
somebody in the state legislature picked up on it. And pretty soon there were state hearings and, and other schools beginning to collect frogs and there was, there was the identification of a farm chemical that was causing the problem with the frogs and potentially could be harmful to humans. Well, there's all kinds of association with service and service learning. The peg on, on service learning, though, is the new vision for young people, seeing them as assets and resources, and then another form of learning or engaged learning. Now, full-time national service of any kind is very, very worthwhile. But if we're serious about service across the spectrum for everybody, the introduction of service in the context of schooling, I think, is, is very, very important to consider. And this is what I've spent my life on. At NYLC, we produced the, the first curricular materials we passed the first state legislation. We, we were instrumental in convening the first group of, of uh, states around the federal legislation. And, and, since, and for the last 25 years, NYLC has conducted the National Service Learning Conference. At that conference, not only have we, do we have routinely representation from every state, but 25 to 30 countries, countries like Palestine, from which I've just returned, where the idea of positive youth development and service learning is beginning to take hold. Well, gathering this all together in terms of how we are motivated to serve and why we serve and why we get involved in this is best expressed by this person. Just to reinforce Dr. King, there's a, the French philosopher Teilhard de Chardin, who is a favorite of mine. De Chardin said, someday after we've harnessed the winds, the tides, and gravity, we'll harness for God the energies of love, and for the second time in history, we will have discovered fire. Harnessing the energies of love in tangible expressions of service, building it into the curriculum as a form of engaged learning, I believe is the greatest strategy we have to bring this across the spectrum of this country and potentially the world. Thank you. <laughs>